Hi, my name is Glenn Gomez. I'm a solutions architect in the commercial line of business for Capital One. Uh, during the journey that we had been experiencing, part of the cloud migration that we had been doing is mainly focus on how the data transformation is going to be enabled for new technologies. We had been actually evaluating uh, multiple platforms that we helping us to move from an ETL batch processing system into more real-time stream base. We have a different set actually of technologies that we are using. During my journey, we evaluate multiple event streaming technologies. In my presentation, I want to be talking about how that decision matrix was making for a solutions architecture in standpoint, how we had been embracing different uh, databases, how we had been moving from a batch processing to a streamline. Our experience with Scylla has been more as a POC at this point where we are heavily used in Cassandra and we try to figure out how we want to be moving from Cassandra and DynamoDB into Scylla, how it's going to be helping us and creating a roadmap for that integration process. That's how I want to be talking about in my presentation. I'm a solutions architect. I joined Capital One uh, two years and a half ago uh, before I was working for Carpillar, which is the one that built those huge yellow construction machines, actually. Uh, I was doing similar stuff for those guys, pretty much helping them when the architecture in part moving, actually, legacy applications, uh, mainly mainframe applications going to the cloud. That's one of the main challenges that I had been facing. Uh, I had been heavily focused on the machine learning, distributed systems, blockchain, all those shiny words that we keep hearing everywhere. I had been going in that one. I really passionate since my background is Hispanic, uh, be part of the involvement in the diversity and inclusion. That's something that is really passion for me. The other one is <clears throat> I always help in the STEAM careers. I believe that we need to create a pipeline in that space. So I go to the middle schools and high schools actually helping them to understand what are the benefits going to the STEM careers. Um, I'm a teacher, actually Capital One has something that we call University Tech College in our side, so I'm part of the teaching group that goes and helping them uh, create more awareness about AWS, what is AWS, since we are using heavily AWS in our case, how AWS is gonna be helping us. Microservices, actually how we can design and build microservices. The other one is CSSC. CSSC is certified secure software engineer, so everybody must need to be aware about the security piece. <clears throat> and of course, I try to spend time with my family. I'm most of the time on the road. I actually have a little dog that is called Bolillo. Um, if, what is a Spanish word, actually what that means is bread in English. And I like to run. I run marathons with my wife. We just run actually the Chicago Marathon a couple of weeks ago. And I love camping, try to spend time, quality time with my family. That's a little bit about me. Now, about the event driven, what we are gonna be trying to convey here is what has been actually the approaches and the decision metrics that we took moving all these mainframe applications, ETL systems, all these batch files processing how we do that and how event-driven design actually and that architecturing had been helping us. How we went to the evaluation process from multiple uh, services and how ended up in selecting a specific one. Uh, some of the technologies that we evaluate, of course, we have to evaluate Kafka. That's something that it was a no-brainer going there. We evaluate Kafka, we evaluate NATS, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, SQLs, because we are heavily in AWS. We are not evaluate actually ACA, but that's something that is in the pipeline actually to go through that process. So those are the technologies that we evaluate. Now, this is part of the lecture, uh, what we went through. What we discovered in AWS for SQS, it's a fully managed service, yes. We don't have to worry about that. Along the coupling situations, here in, in Capital One, we are actually heavily in the APIs and microservices uh, patterns. So creating those synchronous or asynchronous microservices, SQS was helping us in that space, and eliminates the complexity and overhead for managing operating messaging. So that's mean 
It says, it's a managed service. We don't have to worry for managing that piece. That's, that's a good point in that area. Something that we, have, we, we notice is we have, or they offer in two different types of messaging queues. One is the standard queues. That is actually helping us that maximum throughput is going to be helping us to do in ordering and is guaranteed at least once delivery. That's something that is really good. The other one is if you need to go for the FIFO, that's mean first in, first out. So that's mean is something that is going to be helping us at least to guarantee the messaging. That's one point that we consider in this one. Something that we review as well is, okay, what is the functionality that SQS is going to be providing us? Of course, you have unlimited queue messages. Really unlimited, it's not really unlimited, but anyway, they are offering that is going to be offering unlimited. Something that is really important to consider is the payload. The payload has a limitation that you can have only 256 kilobytes maximum size, so if your payload is bigger than that, that means you need to consider different type of service provider in this space. It can go by batches, so that means you can send and receive messages in a batch process that can go 10 by 10, so that can help you to expedite the process. Uh, more of the functionality that is handling is the long pooling. The long pooling is something that is going to be helping us reduce the cost if you want to go and making faster and quick in that space. But that's something that you need to consider as well when you are talking about a resiliency standpoint. You can retain the messages up to 14 days, so that's something that is not durable all the time. That is another decision criteria that you need to do and, and consider. And you can send and receive messages simultaneously. So if we go for that part, you have message locking while we are processing. That means at least you can lock the message and nobody else can read it. You can do sharing the queue. You can do server-side encryption. That's something that is tied with another managed service that they have, the key MS, what they have in their site, AWS. And you can do that letter queues. That's something as well that we consider during the evaluation process. You have a pops up, that means a published subscriber application integration. If you see these two diagrams, Solutions Architects loves to put in diagrams. It's saying, OK, how? It was the existing process and how AWS SQS helping us to decouple that process. If you see in the previous environment, what we have in the system one, you have a lot of publishers. You have a bunch of subscribers, but you need to manage all those queues by yourself manually. You cannot scale. When you implement SQS, SQS is managing everything for you. So you don't need to worry about that extra overhead on managing the clusters. There are different patterns that we have. One is the message queue, as I already mentioned, when you have your producer, you have your queue in the middle, and then you have your consumer. One of the problems when you have these ones is if you want to have multiple consumers and you have message locking, that means when one consumer is reading that one, the other consumer cannot be aware until it's the, it's released from the other consumer. That is more for a synchronous point-to-point -point connectivity that you want to have. If you want to do more as a broadcast, then you need to do the pops up. That means the publish subscriber. The, where you go, you're published, putting in a topic, then you have all your subscribers gone and read from that specific topic. That is SQS. Now, what is NATS? NATS, that's the other service that we evaluated during our process, is a highly performance cloud native message. It can provide foundational. You have two different types of environment from NAT, something that is durable. The other one is just only one type fire and forget type of message that you have in NAT. So that's something that you need to consider when you are doing the evaluation for, for NAT. It is meant to be for highly available, and you don't need to worry about the managing of the service. You can deploy a NATS cluster in a global environment without any problem, and you have at some sort of a high availability by default that is NATS is providing to you. 
The resiliency tier that is offering is highly available worldwide, so you don't need to worry about which region you are deploying these services so easily can go. And you can have that one in a simple standard AWS deployment. You can deploy that one actually using Kubernetes. You can deploy that one using a different containerization process for, for doing that. NAT, the sharing stream process service is meant to be more for a, when you want to handle in and you are willing actually to do fire and forget. That's I mean one of those messages can be lost if you are willing to compromise the data in that space. NATS is the right way because it's faster compared to SQS, doesn't have the limitation of the payload, and you don't need to worry about the clustering environment in this. This is one of the ways that we deployed, actually, if you notice, we have, uh, in Capital One, we have West Region and we have East Region. We try to go at least two different regions in Capital One. And that, the way how we deploy that one is using Kubernetes, and then NATS goes inside that one, then NATS is helping us to connect with every single microservices that we have in our environment. <clears throat> this is just only different representation how NATS is working. The reason why we evaluate NATS is one of the requirements that we have in our site is we need to be multi-tenancy. We have to be able to support multi-tenants. What that multi-tenants means is we need to be able to deploy and support multiple applications that they are not part of the same environment. So that means they cannot be sharing some security groups and security policies in itself. The only way to decouple those ones as a platform is having this multi-tenancy support. That's the way how we have it deployed in Capital One that is helping us actually to be able to run multiple applications inside the same cluster, segregating actually the messaging queues depending on the type of security policies that we need to have in this space. It is really important since Capital One is a bank the segregation of the data actually from our side for regulation is really important. Some of the applications are want to be public facing. Some of them have been need to be private facing. Main of the concern that we have to cover is how to secure the data in that space. NATS helping us actually with the multi-tenancy support to be able to deploy and communicate windows. This is another diagram how is working the communication between one tenant in the right with another tenant on the left, how they are communicating between each other. The dotted lines that we see, barely we can see here, actually is how NATS is communicating and allowing one application be able to communicate in another one in a secure fashion way. The other service that we evaluate was RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ, is really good actually for publishing queues. That's I mean is wanna be really great providing that uh, resiliency. It wanna be allowing you multi consumers that can be connected. That's I mean is wanna be a poop sub. It can allowing you to do a message broker, and is wanna be able to deliver message when the consumer fails. So that's I mean is persistent the message. So that's something that NATS, for example, doesn't guarantee in this space. Something that we have to consider from an architecture in piece is, okay, what is the performance? The performance from Darwin NQ is at least 20,000 messages per second. That's something that is really important when you have a heavily transactional application. You need to consider that one. If you compare with SQS or you compare with NATS, that's something that we need to do. The processing is FIFO. So you have only five for processing. It's highly available. That is by default. You don't need to worry. And it's an open source. That's another area that we put in on the meets and try to consider. If you go and put in on your evaluation criteria, SQS is a vendor locking in one way or another. It's a managed service, but you are locking actually with a specific cloud provider. This one you can port and migrate to any other provider without any problem. This is the way how it works. You have your publisher, then goes to your cluster Robin and queue, and then you can have your multiple subscribers go on and consume with that one. Last one that we evaluate was Kafka. In Kafka, 
of course, you want to be having the producer consumer standpoint. Basically, you define an application actually that is going to be helping you to be highly in next generation. Something in the evaluation criteria as well is how easily you can port and migrate with one platform to another platform, and it's going to be permanent. Your topics are become permanent if you configure it that way, you, cl you Kafka cluster. In the architecturing, what they offer out of the gate that you don't have to worry, you want to be having your producer, consumer, streams, and connectors API. So that means you have a decoupling layer at, as already defined that is going to be creating that abstraction process from you. So you don't have to worry about that API development process. This is how it looks like from a producer and consumer standpoint. If you see on the top, you have all your producers publishing topics to your Kafka cluster. Then you have all your consumers pulling, actually, all those topics. And that way, it can help you to go and create the couple applications and the couple in your microservices that you don't have any dependency from your producers. This heavily diagram actually is how it looks like in Capital One or environment. We have a Kafka clusters that are sitting in a control plane, that's meaning a fleet of uh, Kubernetes fleet servers. And we have every single line of business or every single application going and published to those topics. And then we have all those other systems going and consumed for that one. This is helping us actually to move and push the envelope, considering that in the before we used to have all these bash files, ETL files, going from the mainframe. How we can start modernizing that process and doing all this data transformation in our site, I'm not talking about anything in the database space. I'm talking about how we can make the data reliable, actually, to be consumed by another systems. We now worry to create point-to-point -point connectivity. This is how we decouple it in Capital One. We create <clears throat> processes that is helping us to go and publish to one lake. That's mean all the data is become available in one lake. Then going to our data warehousing for an analytical perspective, we have a system that is handling all our metadata registration, all our quality checks that we have to go. That way our consumers can go and subscribe to those topics without any problem and without any friction. Freeing up all the producers from a point-to-point -point connectivity. Now, talking about Scylla, Capital One right now is in the process, actually, of the evaluation of Scylla. We are on the POC. One of the main challenges that we try to cover, actually, is how we can move our Mongo application, our Mongo databases, trying to see how Scylla is going to be helping us. This is one of the examples that you hear last year about how Scylla and Kafka are using which companies are going to that space. Capital One soon is going to be in that diagram as well. But this is just only showing how Scylla is going and taking over and how Capital One is starting embracing. For us, for example, one of the points is first we need to go to a single point, a single database, then we can start going to uh, investing and changing and transforming our database areas. So takeaways. The takeaways and the evaluation how we go is, first of all, we need to understand what are what's our system requirements, what are all those significant architectural requirements and decision records that we went through. We evaluate all these specific and different event-driven systems and try to come out with a solution how we can decouple. This does help us actually going and narrow down to this specific implementation process. Part of the significant requirements that we go and Capital One is, of course, you need to be aligned with the business and the technology side. We have to be able to be highly resilient, and we need to be able to enable in all uh, development teams actually to move faster without creating any friction. 
The categories that we evaluated, and I, I highlighted some of them is, okay, what is the availability that you're gonna be having us? The maintainability, observability, performance, resiliency, testability, usability, so on and so forth. All of those words that uh, solutions architects all the time concerns, when we are trying to make a decision which technology are we gonna be using. Something interesting that we ended up actually is after all the evaluation, if you notice in our process, we select Kafka as a platform, but as well we select Nats actually for helping us decoupling our platform services. So some of the decision records that we went for Nats is we are saying, okay, it's powerful, it's open source, it's something that is gonna be enabling us in the, in the wrong way. Uh, why we need a message broker, I already mentioned is resiliency, availability, and why we need to do and be able to persist that data. Something, why not Kafka? Why we don't select Kafka for this specific case? I already mentioned we select Kafka, for example, for all our event streaming process and persist that one. We select NATS because we want to be able to fire forget and we're able to compromise just only the messaging. Why not Rabin and Q? There are more decisions about it requires explicit definition of the public and subscriber. That's something that is coupling us and we don't want to go that way. We really like actually how the security is managing NATS based on OPA, open policy agent. So that's the way how it's helping us. And this is just only a simple comparison matrix about how we went through all the process and said what in Axe, what is good in Rabbit, what is good in Kafka, what is good in, in P2P. Here are some reference. You want to be having access actually to this uh, presentation, so if you want to go deep a little bit in one of the topics, these are the reference that I use for my presentation. 